Good morning. Have you had a good week? A good week beats a bad one every time, right? I'm glad you're here this morning. Let's uh, stand together and open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I guess this is Jonathan's water. I'm not going to drink out of it because he may have already done it. I don't want to get music germs. There we go. Uh, we've been in a series called What Does God Want Me to Be? And we talked about several things that God wants us to be and what God wants us to have. And one of the things we're going to talk about this morning is that God wants us to be people whose hearts are full of joy. Is your heart full of joy? If you know Jesus, it should be. And that's what God wants us to be. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16, always be joyful. That's short, isn't it? Let's say that together. Always be joyful. You all stand alike. Some of you look like this. Always be joyful. Come on, we don't need any Eeyores out there this morning, right? Let's say it again. Always be joyful. Much better. Let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning for the joy of Jesus that nothing can ever take away. I pray that you bless us as we study your word this morning. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. If I were to ask the question, as a country, are we happy today? If I were to ask you as an individual, are you happy today? As we look at our country, we are discovering since they've been taking such kinds of polls like happiness polls or whatever you want to call them, we are more unhappy today, generally speaking, as a country than we've ever been. In fact, I was curious as to how unhappy are we. You, the United States is number 18. There are many other countries ahead of us in that level of happiness, and we go all the way down to number 18. In fact, out of 40 countries that were polled, we're number 18, almost directly in the middle. Countries like Finland, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, Canada, all of those do better on those happiness polls than those of us who live in the United States of America. Unhappiness seems to be growing and growing. I've told you I'm working on a sermon series I'm going to preach in the fall concerning the family. And teenagers today, as they self-diagnose, are more unhappy than they've ever been before. Our teenagers are. And so it's very concerning. What in the world is going on and why, when we have so much, and the world would say you ought to be happy because you have so much, why are we so unhappy? In fact, if you make $34,600 a year, did you know that in the world you are a one percenter? You didn't know that, did you? So we have a lot. We are a very wealthy country. America's poorest are wealthier than over 90 some odd percent of the rest of the world. So we've got all this stuff. We've got all this money. Some of you are saying, I don't have any, but you know what I'm talking about. We've got more than most. Amen. I'll prove it to you. How many of you have a refrigerator at home? Would you raise your hand? How many of you have any food in that refrigerator? <laughs> How many of you plan on going out to eat somewhere after we're through a church today? Would you raise your hand? All right, most of you, a lot of you. How many of you have a home to live in? See, we are, we are rich, aren't we? I mean, we are blessed way more than we deserve to be blessed. So here we have all of these things and all of this stuff, and yet we are very unhappy. Our crisis is social. It's not economical as a country. We have lost our identity. We don't know who we are anymore as a country. Everything seems to be, have been turned upside down. All of the things that we used to value, now those things are being thrown out the window, and the new set of values that are coming in, no one understands them. And they make no sense to us. And so we look at our world as it's getting turned on its ear, so to speak, and we're wondering what in the world is going on. And that is creating a level of an unhappiness in America. In fact, there's a graph here that kind of demonstrates our declining happiness. If you'll show that graph, look at this. From 1972 to 2016, you can see a steady, steady decline of high school dropouts, high school graduates, college educated, and yet we seem to be going down the hill when it comes to our level of happiness. But the Bible says that as believers, we should be joyful. Everyone say joyful. 
Look at the person next to you and say, are you joyful today? So the Bible says go contrary to what the world is saying. But how can we do that? And what does it mean to have joy in your heart? Now let me tell you something. If you know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you already have joy inside of you. All you need to do is discover it. It's there. And sometimes because of life, it gets covered up, doesn't it? I mean, you got so much junk going on in life that it's just like, you know, it was down on the ground and they're just piles and piles and piles being heaped upon that thing called joy. And it's so down, so far down there now, we can't see it. And, and so we need to uncover some of that stuff, take it off and get rid of it so we can get back to that joy that is rightfully ours because we know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So then what is the pathway? to joyfulness how can we get there where God wants us to be I could ask it this way what does it take to have real joy because a lot of the joy that the world has to offer us is not real joy at all it's happiness but it's not real joy and there is a difference between happiness and joy so how can we get to that core meaning the biblical core meaning of that word joy again it says be joyful let's say that again but Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. King James says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. So the Bible is chock full of verses that tell us and tries to shape how we behave in life that we should be full of joy. It is a commandment not only for the individual, but it's a commandment for the church as well. Now, when you contrast what was going on there, you see that it's not a suggestion at all. Uh, Paul is not saying, be joyful when you feel like it, right? He's not saying, be joyful if everything is going your way. How many of you are old enough to remember that old song? Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Oh, what a beautiful morning. What's that last line? Everything is going my way. But sometimes that's not true in life. Sometimes we look at life, and life has just jumped all over us in a negative manner, and we wonder where in the world is the joy that I'm supposed to have in the Lord Jesus because right now it doesn't seem like I've got very much joy in my life. And yet Paul in his writing says, have joy. Be joy. It's an, an imperative. He's saying, be joyful. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Now the thing that's interesting about the Apostle Paul is he spoke a whole lot about joy. Philippians is often called the book of joy. And you know when Philippians was written? It was written when the, when the Apostle Paul was sitting in prison. And yet he's talking about having joy here. And notice that he says, I say it again. He said, I want you to have joy. And then he says, I say it again. He's emphasizing the fact that you and I are supposed to have joy. Did you know he used that word joy more than any other word that he ever used, that he wrote down? So he is emphasizing the fact that life is going to throw some curves at you. He's saying, here I am sitting in jail, in prison. And prison back then was not like prisons, a lot of prisons today. They were dark and they were damp and they were moldy and musky and they didn't care how you felt about anything. It didn't matter to them. They didn't even care if you starved to death while you were sitting in there. And yet the Apostle Paul said, I have joy in my heart. It seemed to be the theme of his life. Now, this command was meant for that church there at Philippi. You know, the first Baptist church of Philippi. We know it's a Baptist church, amen? But not just for the church at Philippi. This command was meant for all churches at all times, no matter the circumstances, no matter the hardships, and the church at Philippi had some struggles, and they had some hardships, and, and all of those churches back then did. I mean, they struggled to even exist. They didn't have nice buildings like we have. They didn't have padded pews and air conditioning and all of those things. In fact, many of them would gather inside of caves to have worship services because they were afraid they would be discovered and they would be killed for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church was suffering back then. And here's the Apostle Paul sitting in prison. And what is he facing? He's facing something called death. And even though he's in prison... It's amazing enough that he said, have joy while he's in prison. But now he knows that his death is coming. 
And even in the face of death, the Apostle Paul says, I still have joy. While he's penning those words, knowing in the back of his mind, he was a human, wasn't he? Sometimes we read uh, about these Bible characters and we think well you know they were beyond human no they weren't he was a human being just like you and just like me but he had the spirit of God that lived in him and he had faith in God and he said God no matter what I'm going to trust you now let me ask you a question do we have it worse today right now do you have it worse in your life today right now than the apostle Paul had it back then what's the answer church we don't we don't We've got a lot to be thankful for. And if you are not experiencing Christian joy this morning, something is wrong. Something in your spirit. Maybe you're not walking with God like you should walk with God. Maybe you're not serving the Lord. You're you're never going to have Christian joy until you start serving the Lord. Did you know that? Because God didn't call you just to sit in a pew. He called you to serve Him. He saves you to serve Him. Amen? And that's what God wants you to do. Serve Him. Figure it out. What is it that God can use me for? How can I plug into God's plan for my life? What does he want me to do for him? What does he want me to accomplish for him? And you can't do these things unless you've got joy, and you can't have joy unless you're serving the Lord. So we need to understand it. Maybe we don't understand that. Maybe we thought, well, I know, I'll just get my fire insurance. That's what I'll do. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I mean, I'll get saved so I don't have to go to hell when I die. But it begins there and ends there. Did you know that salvation is not the last step to Christianity? It's the first step. It's just starting on the pathway. It's just starting that journey. It's just starting that walk. But God has many wonderful things in store for you. If you'll just walk with him, maybe you don't understand it and you haven't served him. And because you haven't served him and you're not walking with him like you should, then you don't have any joy in your life. That's no surprise. It shouldn't be to any of us. God saved you to serve. Can we say that together? God saved me to serve. Say that again. Maybe we're not looking for joy. Have you ever known someone, I mentioned it earlier, have you ever known someone like, and, and they kind of enjoy wallowing around in their self-pity? They're like Eeyore. They can win $10 million in the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. You say, man, I heard you won $10 million. Yeah. I wish it had been fifteen. Maybe we're not looking for joy. There's there's reasons to have joy all around us. And I'll talk about it more in a moment. But all around us, if we'll just open up our eyes and see how much God has blessed us. So what are you looking for? Man, we've got so many people today, even Christians, that are severely depressed. Depressed. I read a story about a man who was um, shipwrecked on a little deserted island. Actually, he was out in his boat and it... He was way out where he shouldn't have been, and, it, and he, he wrecked it. He hit some rocks, and it, it sank, and a few of the items that he had on that little boat washed up on the shore, but it was a deserted island. He's the only one on it. So after a while, when he began to realize that I don't think I'm going to be rescued anytime soon, he built himself a little hut, and, and the few things that had washed up on the shore, he placed inside that hut so he would have them, and that's all he owned in the world was that hut and a few things inside it. One day he went out hunting, and when he got back from hunting, he he began to notice in a distance there was smoke, and and he starts running toward that smoke, and his little hut had caught on fire, and it burned to the ground, and he just fell on the ground. He was a Christian, and he began to weep. He said, God, I don't understand this. I'm on this deserted island, and now everything that I own is gone. I've got nothing left, absolutely nothing, and he just wept, and he wept, and he wept cried himself to sleep that night while his hut smoldered. Early the next morning, there was a ship he saw at a distance. And one of the men on that ship was rowing a boat towards that small little island. And when he got there, he said, man, we would have never known you were here if we hadn't seen that fire. Now, here's the point I want you to make. That man's last straw That man's last straw was actually God rescuing him. So when you get down to your last straw, sometimes you think, I'm just going to throw the towel in and quit. Don't you quit because it's God rescuing you. God's always got a plan for you. And that right there ought to give us joy. Amen. 
I'm not doing life by myself. I, I'm walking and journeying through life with my Savior and my Lord. And the Bible is either true or it's not true. In Romans chapter 8, verse 25, it says, All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Do you love the Lord this morning? Do you believe that verse is true? God's always at work. One of the things you discover when you've been around a little while, when you've lived a little while is what I mean, is that life has many layers. And some of those layers are painful and some of those layers are joyful. It's kind of like building a cake, you know. You go through all of these life experiences and if you're walking with God and you trust God and you have faith in God, then the end result is there's going to be a better you than if you hadn't gone through some of those difficult struggles and trials and times in your life. How many of you like sugar? Would you raise your hand? How many of you like just to eat a spoonful of sugar right now? You know, I don't think it tastes very good. Now you put it in a Snickers bar, I'm all for it. How many of you like flour? I don't think I'd want a spoonful of flour. Anybody here like to drink or eat raw eggs? Like Rocky? <laughs> Adrian! I don't want to eat no draw eggs. You're crazy. But man, you take some sugar and flour and raw eggs. What else do you put in to make a cake? Butter, lots of butter. Cocoa, whatever you got to put in it. And you mix it all up. You put it in a pan. You put it in the oven. And it comes out a cake. That's what I'm talking about, amen? A cake, I like that. But I don't want to eat any of those individual ingredients all by themselves. I'll eat a cake all day long. It takes a lot of food to keep me this fat. You know? But I don't want, I don't want that. See, that's what I'm talking. You get the application. God takes all of these different life experiences and he puts them in a bowl and the Holy Spirit is just mixing it up so that you'll become more like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not less like Jesus, more like Jesus. And it comes down to one thing. Do I trust God or not? Even when I don't understand. Have you ever had something happen in your life and you've said, God, I don't understand this. You ever had that happen? I have. I've had many times. I've had things happen. I say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand this. I've had people come to me, and they'll lose a loved one, sometimes tragically, and they say, Pastor, why? Why would God allow this to happen? And my theological answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I do know that when you can't trace God's hand, you can always trust God's heart. When I don't know what God is up to, I know I can always trust him. So there's nothing that will ever happen to any of us that God is unaware of or that God didn't allow or that God won't use for his glory if you just trust him. You see, our joy, brothers and sisters, is not anchored to this world. It comes from God, amen? This world is fickle. How many of you would say this morning that this world has sure changed a lot since I was a kid? It's fickle. But our joy is anchored to the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes from another world, not this world. It comes from heaven itself, from God's heart to our heart. Here's the second thing. Let's talk about the benefits of joyfulness. What are the benefits of joyfulness? Our relationship is strengthened when we decide we're going to be people of joy. I want to read to you something, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It's kind of lengthy, but bear with me. Chapter 6, verse 4 through 10. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten. But we have not always been killed or have not been killed. 
Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we have spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. Look at this. As servants of God, they'd had, right here it says it, they had troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. And what did all of that result in? Purity, understanding, patience, kindness, and love. All of those things had a good result, right? If we give it to God, it'll always have a good result because God is always about the business of teaching us. That's what he's doing. Something else I see here, God renews our joy each day, every day. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. <laughs> That's a man who's grown in the Lord. Amen. He heavenly joy does what? It renews us. When the world says, you've got nothing to be joyful for, you say, oh, yes, I do. The Lord God lives in me. He's blessed me. Think about Paul and Silas when they were in jail and in that prison. And, and I've shared this with you before, but at midnight, the Bible says they were singing praises unto the Lord. That's amazing to me because I know me. How many of you are like me? If you'd been out serving the Lord, doing what God had called you to do, fulfilling the will of God for your life, and you'd been doing that and you wound up in prison, would any of you complain? If the person next to you would probably complain, would you raise your hand? I know I would. But there they are singing praises to the Lord. There was a carpenter that had a bad day. He got up to leave for work. He gets in his truck and discovers that he's got a flat tire. While he's at work, his skill saw quit working. And then when he got off work, he goes back to his truck, puts the key in, turns it, and he discovered that his battery had died. So he had to have a friend help him go to the store and get a new battery and put that in his truck. But when he got home, he did something rather strange. He, he, stopped, he stopped in front of a small little tree right by his house, and he put his hands on the leaves of that tree. And then he walked into the home happy to see his family. He called that tree his troubled tree. He said, I just leave my troubles on that tree before I walk in the door of my home. And it's an amazing thing because the next morning when I go back outside, they're not there anymore. Maybe all of us need to have a little trouble tree in our front yard. But nonetheless, we should always give our troubles to Jesus. Amen. Give them to Jesus. Give them to Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Here's the third thing. How can we sustain our joy? How do we make it last? Well, we can find new joys, the Bible says, and we're commissioned to find new joys every single day of our life. Some people just look for negativity every day of their life. And that's what they spew and that's what they spout because they see nothing good in anything or anyone or any circumstance. So we need to retrain our minds and we need to begin to look for things that will give us joy. And notice that it says in verse 16, always do this. King James says, forevermore do this. In other words, this kind of joy that, that God wants to give us is never ending. It, it's not temporal joy. It's permanent joy. It will always be with us. And guess what? This joy is not based on emotion. It's not. You know, we can be happy, sad, and mad all in an hour. Am I right? All in the same hour, you know. I get in my car, I'm on I-45, I'm happy and driving along. I'm in the passing lane. Somebody is going slow in the passing lane. Now I'm sad. And I flash my lights at them, and they refuse to move over. And now I'm mad. It's easy to happen that way where we get happy, sad, mad all the same day, all the same hour. But should that affect the joy that I've got in the Lord Jesus? No, because my joy is based not on emotion but on a relationship to Jesus. Look at this. Be assured of God's presence with you always. Every moment of every day, God is with you. The Bible says in John chapter 16, verse 22, So, you have sorrow now. But I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. 
Every single one of us in this room right now have had times where we've had tears flowing down our cheeks. Every one of us have had those times when our hearts are so heavy they feel like they're going to break and that we can't even breathe. But Jesus is saying right here, understand this. That heartbreak is only temporary. Jesus is saying it will not last. So you don't have any right, nor do I, to walk through life being miserable and mad and angry. Because that's not what God has called us to do. God has called us to walk with him in joy, and we've got so much to be thankful for. I, I think we ought to count our blessings. I'm going to list a few things here, and I'm going to go through it rapid fire. But as I list something that resonates with your heart, and you would say, that's me, I want to hear a great big amen. And I want us to open up our eyes and look around right now and see our kids. Are you thankful for them? How about your grandkids? Are you thankful for them? we got a lot to be thankful for. How about the rest of your family? Are you thankful for them? How about your friends? Are you thankful God's given you friends? God gave you a job. Are you thankful for that? If you've got health, we ought to be thankful for that. you got a church home, a church family. Are you thankful for Spring Baptist? you got a home to live in. Are you thankful for that? Oh, we got a lot. Just retrain ourselves. Open up our eyes. I, I want us to look up and see the one who was born so we don't have to die, who has always been with us, the one who has blessed us beyond measure, the one who has taken care of us in times of trouble, the one who's brought healing to our hearts, the one who saved our kids and our grandkids. Look up and see the one who healed your marriage. Look up and see the one who mended a broken relationship. Look up and see the one who rescued you from drugs and alcohol. Look up and see the one who forgave you when you didn't deserve it look up and see the one who promised you heaven look up and see the one who gives you peace in times of trouble look up and see the one who gives you a reason to be get up in the morning look up and see the one who gives hope to the hopeless look up and see the one who gave you family when you were alone look up and see the one who's been a friend to the friendless look up and see the one who gives joy to the brokenhearted look up See Jesus. See Jesus. He loves you. Let's stand together.